This video is sponsored by Raycon. Tonight's topic of discussion is an enduring mystery that I actually haven't seen a lot of coverage on so far. Dubbed the impossible murder by those privy to it at the time, this case concerns an unassuming elderly couple in 1930s England and was highly controversial due to its trial. The outcome of said trial led to a first in English legal history, as well as the belief that an innocent man had been spared the gallows or that a cold-blooded criminal had been allowed to walk free. Now, despite the conviction of the court of public opinion, if the facts of this case are to be believed, there's almost no way that this man could have physically committed this act. Before we dive into details though, a quick word from today's sponsor, Raycon. So we're just a few weeks away from Christmas now, and if you're still stumped when it comes to gift ideas, look no further than Raycon. This is a brand that I've been working with for years now, and for as long as I've used their products, I've never had them break or malfunction in any way, which is something I definitely look for when really buying anything. Prior to this, I suffered with nasty wired headphones that always seemed to break after a few short months. If not that, then I'd be dealing with some other nonsense that made pairing feel like rocket science, whereas with Raycon, it's an easy and seamless process that I never have to tinker with. Even better, they've got a 54 hour battery life, so charging barely crosses my mind. Now, I usually talk about Raycon earbuds, but they actually have a number of other products such as headphones and speakers. Really, anything and everything you could think of, no matter who you're shopping for. Whether it's the athlete or gamer in your life, Raycon gives you premium sound, a variety of useful features, and a comfortable, almost custom fit. All of this, and they still start at about half the price of other premium audio brands, but if you're still looking to save more, you're in luck. For the next month, Raycon is having a countdown to Christmas, featuring a new pop-up flash deal every single day. But if you'd like to save 15% right now, then head on over to buyraycon.com slash rainbot and use code HOLIDAY. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash rainbot and promo code HOLIDAY. Thanks so much to Raycon for making this content possible, and with that said, let's get back into it. The year is 1931. The subject, one William Herbert Wallace, age 52. On the surface, Wallace didn't seem very notable. He was an insurance agent at Prudential and lived what most would consider to be a pretty quiet life. His younger days were a bit more colorful, having odd jobs in places like India and Shanghai, before health issues ultimately forced him to return to England. One might argue that this was a blessing in disguise because in 1911, Wallace met Julia, and just two years later, the couple would marry, eventually settling down at 29 Wolverton Street in Liverpool's Anfield District. The Wallaces never had any children, but nonetheless seemed perfectly content. They generally kept to themselves, and despite living at 29 Wolverton for a decade and a half, none of the neighbors ever noticed any sort of tension between the two. In fact, many described them as a seemingly loving couple. Julia, per Wallace, was an excellent pianist and watercolor artist, who was also fluent in French and had what he considered to be a very cultured literary taste. Wallace dabbled in science and philosophy and was described as intellectual, albeit a bit fussy and pedantic at times. Still, he did try his hand at the arts, taking up a handful of violin lessons at age 50, presumably so he could attempt to play music with his wife. Together, the couple enjoyed trips to the countryside as well as the occasional night out at the cinema. Of Wallace's many hobbies, however, there was one that stood out from the rest, chess. While his skills as a player are up for debate, there's no denying that the man was enthusiastic. In fact, it was one of the few things that could manage to get Wallace out of the house and away from Julia. As it turns out, however, in a cruel twist of fate, a chess match would mark the beginning of the end for this couple. January 19th, 1931, Monday. The day is now over, and Wallace has just settled in for his match within a local championship competition. Before he could begin, however, he was flagged down by the venue's owner, who'd received a phone call some half an hour before Wallace's arrival. The owner explained that the caller spoke in a strong, gruff voice, and rather than calling back later, preferred for Wallace to meet him at his home the next evening at around 7.30pm. Why? The caller claimed to be a potential client looking to set up insurance for his newly 21-year-old daughter. In fact, the caller claimed that it was his daughter's birthday and that that's actually why he couldn't call back later. He claimed that his name was R.M. Qualtro, which I'll be calling Q from this point forward. His address, 25 Menlove Gardens East, Mossley Hill. Wallace dutifully jotted down all these details, but was very quick to admit that none of it sounded familiar to him in the slightest. He asked around and no one else seemed to recognize the man, nor his address either. The reason for this will become apparent shortly. It's unclear whether or not Wallace won his match, but nonetheless, the night seemed to play out as usual and in no time at all, Wallace was on his way back home. January 20th, 1931, Tuesday. On what appeared to just be another Tuesday, Wallace reportedly worked as he always did, collecting insurance money from clients between the hours of 3.30 and 5.45. 
According to those who did business with Wallace that afternoon, he seemed quite normal, even cracking jokes and enjoying tea with one of them. Once Wallace was done doing his rounds, he presumably went home. This would have been at about 6 p.m. At this point, it's between 6.30 and 6.45 p.m., which to most might not sound like a big difference, but as we'll soon find out, this minor detail became somewhat of the crux of the entire case. Whichever it was, Julia was still doing fine around this time, going about her day as usual. We know this because this is when a local milk boy stopped by to collect Julia's dues, a business transaction right before the poor woman would meet her untimely end. Meanwhile, bits and pieces of witness chatter would allow us to follow Wallace once more. It's now approximately 7.10 p.m. Wallace is spotted some 20 minutes away from his home, connecting to the next tram line on his journey to find Q and Menlove Gardens East. Since Wallace was unfamiliar with the area, he made sure to badger everyone and everyone he could for directions. Tram operators, policemen, no one was spared. Now, here's where an interesting issue arose. There indeed was a Menlove Avenue, as well as Menlove Gardens West, South, and North, but no Menlove Gardens East. Some who gave Wallace directions told him this, while others assumed that Menlove Gardens East must be somewhere near the other Menloves, as one would guess. Once Wallace was in the Menlove area, he again asked around some more, but as expected, no luck. By 8.20, the search was looking fruitless, and Wallace decided to turn back despite the potential new client. The next update we get comes from Wallace's neighbors at number 31. At around 8.45 p.m., they were getting ready for a night out and about when they suddenly heard knocking coming from outside. Upon checking, they found a perplexed-looking Wallace who quickly asked them if they noticed anything strange going on, also pointing out that he tried both the front and back doors with his keys, but they didn't seem to be working. With his neighbors now standing by to assist, Wallace once again tried to gain entry in his back door, and for some reason, this time the key worked. The door popped open, leading to complete darkness. Wallace walked in and started lighting lamps. He went upstairs to check the bedroom and eventually back downstairs once again. That is when he reached his sitting room, and when he found his wife's lifeless body on the floor just in front of the fireplace. Blunt force injuries to her head made it apparent that Julia was well past the point of being helped. The early investigation didn't exactly do much for this case. In fact, all it did was open up more questions instead of answers. All things considered, the Wallace home wasn't all that disturbed, save for a few things slightly out of place. Blood wasn't found anywhere else aside from the body, not in the bathtub, nor the clothing Wallace himself was wearing that day. There was a cabinet that was broken into along with four pounds said to be missing from a cash box inside, but other than that, there didn't seem to be anything that would indicate a robbery had gone wrong here. There was also an issue of a missing fireplace poker, along with what was described as an iron bar, the latter of which was allegedly found several years later during a renovation of the property. The poker, however, if it was even missing at all, has never been seen since, and to many, it was the most probable weapon in this case, especially considering where Julia's body was positioned. Now, the area surrounding the home had been searched, but the poker was just never found. It goes without saying that in cases like this, you naturally look at every lead that you can manage to dig up. In the case of the Wallaces, there were no substantial tales of infidelity or falling out of love, no obvious third party that might want Julia dead. Again, Julia was quite shy and kept to herself and her husband. It seemed almost unbelievable that someone would want to do her harm, and in such a gruesome way at that. If not a burglary, then what was the point of all this? Of course, it's heavily assumed that whoever Q was, he must have been the killer. His summoning Wallace to Menlove Gardens East was simply to get him out of the way, that is, if Q and Wallace aren't the same person. The court of public opinion had decided from the get-go that this was indeed the case, that Wallace was guilty. To them, only one person could have motive to kill Julia, and this automatically made Wallace the culprit. This attitude was reflected by the jury, who after a four-day long trial took only one hour to sentence Wallace to the gallows. This despite lacking a smoking gun. The judge presiding over the case strongly disagreed with the jury, in fact reminding them of their civil duty to find Wallace not guilty unless they could be sure, based on the evidence, that he had in fact killed Julia Wallace. The judge explained that the question in this particular trial was not who killed Julia, but rather, did Wallace kill Julia? And if so, what was the proof? If another had indeed committed the crime, it would be up to the investigation to find that out. That courtroom, however, was tasked on just one specific person, Wallace, as well as the evidence presented by both the defense and prosecution. Now, whether or not Wallace did kill Julia, I can't say, but I will present the most common points both for and against him. One big point would be the matter of motive. Wallace didn't seem to have one. No quarrels or side lovers, not even an expensive life insurance policy on Julia since she was only insured for a small sum. Wallace would pass away just a couple of years after Julia's death, and in that time, there was no wild change of lifestyle or new wife. 
Now, could Wallace and Julia have not as been happy as they seemed? Absolutely. There's no telling what goes on behind closed doors, especially when it comes to an almost two decade long marriage. But let's say that Wallace did want to kill Julia for some reason. His plan being to stage a call from a fake would-be client, one that everyone at the chess club would hear about. This, along with his Tuesday evening wild goose chase, would be his airtight alibi. The evidence? According to the prosecution, the call from Key was traced to a phone booth a mere 400 yards away from the Wallace household. Had Wallace left his home at about 7.15 that night, he would have reached the phone booth by around 7.18, just in time to make the 7.20 call that the owner of the venue would later answer. After all, this supposed stranger to Wallace somehow knew his schedule well enough to know that he'd be at the chess club. How was that possible? Well, to this, Wallace's defense had a few rebuttals. The venue owner claimed himself that it would be a stretch if Wallace had been the one to call. In his opinion, Q sounded nothing like the man. If we do assume that Q was some third-party criminal, then he could have been watching Wallace leave, having seen him pass the phone booth and taking this as the signal to make his move. Now, why didn't he just kill Julia then? No one knows. As for how Q would have known of Wallace's schedule, well, as it turns out, since Wallace was participating in a championship game, his name was actually readily available on the club's roster, which anyone could view. It goes without saying that if Q was someone else, he must have known the Wallaces closely enough to where he didn't want to be recognized, hence leaving a message with the venue owner instead of waiting for Wallace to be present and then calling back, or perhaps leaving a message with Julia, who was obviously home when he made the call to the chess club. Perhaps the most contentious point of this whole case, though, is the matter of whether or not Wallace could have even physically committed the crime, and this comes down to a matter of timing. The milk boy claimed to have seen Julia at 6.30 p.m. The next time we hear from Wallace is at approximately 7.10 p.m. at a location 20 minutes away. This means that at the latest, Wallace would have had to leave his home at 6.50 p.m. in order to make his 7.10 position. With this in mind, Wallace would have had to kill Julia, clean up, not get blood anywhere else in the house, ruffle up the area slightly, all between 6.30 and 6.50, 20 minutes at most. Now, this in and of itself is already a feat. Speed would be one thing, but precision as well. Again, the house was basically spotless as far as blood went, so the idea of someone in that much of a hurry keeping things clean is a stretch. Now, a stretch, yes, but perhaps not impossible. 6.30 p.m. was what the prosecution was banking on, but it wasn't as concrete as they'd hoped. While the milk boy claimed that he picked up Julia's payment at 6.30 p.m., a local paper girl testified that the boy wasn't at Wallace's door at number 29 by the time she left number 27, allegedly around 6.43 p.m. A few neighborhood boys would corroborate this, claiming to have seen the paper girl leaving a few minutes after 6.45. Now, why does this matter? If Julia was actually last seen around 6.45, it makes Wallace's involvement essentially impossible. It would have left him with only about five minutes to murder his wife, clean up, etc., etc. If you recall, Wallace was found by his neighbors outside of his home, claiming that his key didn't work on either door. Once his neighbors were fully present, he once again tried the back door, and lo and behold, it suddenly worked just fine. Now that absolutely sounds suspicious, but the issues here lie in the fact that these doors and locks were never closely examined. The front and back doors are often mentioned here, but there was also supposedly a third door connecting directly to the kitchen. Which one was used at any given time is already unclear, but one thing that could explain all of this is that whichever door Wallace had gained entry with had a rusty lock or handle. According to Wallace, the mechanism was faulty and would sometimes get stuck, and if you've ever had a similar issue, you'll know how much of a pain it can be. But what about the state of the home itself? Sure, a small sum of four pounds had allegedly been taken, but why not more? If this was indeed a robbery, why not take as much as possible? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that this was never just a robbery, even if a few small things had been taken. Counterpoint though, if Wallace wanted to stage this as a robbery, then the same question applies. Why not make it look more like a robbery? We could go on, but only one truth is apparent right now. This case simply had nowhere to go. No smoking gun for Wallace, and no obvious leads to who might have done this if not him. In the end, Wallace's sentence was overturned due to insufficient evidence, the first time that this was ever done in English legal history. While Wallace was able to walk free per the courts, the same couldn't exactly be said of his personal life. Wallace was still very much guilty in the court of public opinion and was harassed to the point of having to relocate. In just a few short years, Wallace's health issues would catch up to him, and in 1933, he passed away. Following his death, Wallace's private diary entries were made public. Within them, he lamented over the loss of his wife, seemingly remembering her fondly while also expressing suspicion at a colleague from Prudential who he suspected might have been the actual killer. At one point, he wrote about considering sending a private investigator to tail said person, although he never did overtly mention 
mention them by name. Depending on where you read, it'll say that Wallace either died due to rejecting a surgery that could have saved his life, or that said surgery failing is what killed him. Either way, the man definitely wasn't living large after Julia passed. Now, if we do assume that Wallace was innocent, then who in the world would have wanted Julia dead and why? The crime itself was particularly gruesome and appeared as though it would have taken a lot of hatred to commit. Still, whoever did this was calculated enough not to leave behind any substantial evidence, assuming that the police didn't somehow mess up their investigation entirely. Almost a hundred years later, and here we are still discussing this, no closer to an answer as those folks in Liverpool all that time ago. There's been a recent spike of long-time unsolved mysteries suddenly getting figured out, and while the truth here seems like it will never see the light of day, we can only hope that it eventually does.